Carol Jaffe is the author of the book Brute, Writings on Art and Artists. His writing career spans four decades with 29 uniquely provocative books, such as 15 Serial Killers, Porn Anti-Porn, Death Cafe, Induced Coma, Goose Step, and Anti-Twitter. My name is Robert James Cross. I wanted to start with a question about the format of this collection, one familiar to you, docufiction. Can you give me a brief summation of docufiction and how you incorporated it into these texts? No genre, especially prose genre, is pure. Fiction is dotted with nonfiction. Memoir is filled with fiction. You ask elsewhere, when did news become ideology? It has always been that way because of nationalist concerns, which are always prominent. But TV and the internet, with a visual emphasis on telegenic broadcasters and the unstoppable encroachment of capitalism, have considerably exacerbated the situation. Capitalist greed, disguised as honesty, trust, or any other virtue is the prime mover and like Midas, it is a greed that is never fulfilled. Docufiction is meant to expose that breach of trust, the lie that the apparent real is in fact real, by highlighting it. How did you decide on your chosen art and artists for the collection? In every instance, I chose artists who managed to transfigure their emotional pain into art. A tragic art, of course which is arguably the highest art. I include uh, Sylvia Plath, Nina Simone, Clarice Lispector, uh, Simone Weil, Samuel Beckett, James Baldwin, Marlon Brando, Antonine Artaud, all artists who transformed their extreme emotional pain into the richest art we have. Two artists are perhaps different, John Berger and Artaud. Berger himself did not seem to suffer emotionally but he was committed to writing about humans who did suffer. Artaud suffered enormously and wanted his tormented body rather than his often unhinged but potent writing to represent his art. That is, his great emotional pain is to be transfigured not into his writings but into his wasted, tormented body. Queen of Hearts. The Queen of Hearts was in a cluster of a hundred women, each of whom resembled her. They were performing the ghost dance, imagining that it would protect them from the white genociders, even as the mounted U.S. cavalry was advancing. They were all shot dead, but for one who continued to dance faster, faster, with madness in her feet, her face was a white mask, war painted with mustangs and buffalo. She ghost danced and refused to die. In my dream, she was the Queen of Hearts. Where did the image of Queen of Hearts come from? And how are you using the three or four single page Queen of Hearts units spread through the volume? The Queen of Hearts is an idealized fantasy I created of a female performance artist of unclear origins whose performances have to do with encouraging heart feeling at the expense of her life. She will, for example, devise a spectacle of falling from a high building and lie critically hurt on the cement until other humans gather her up and rush her to the hospital or otherwise tend to her. She is a performance artist whose art resides between death and life. She is the Queen of Compassion. The Queen of Hearts ancestry is deliberately obscured. I have her ghost dancing with native women because of the significance of the ghost dance derived from a northern Paiute shaman uh, which among other miracles is meant to protect Native American people from the bullets of the U.S. cavalry. It didn't work, at least in this world. What is your brief text, Pasolini, actually about? Pier Paolo Pasolini was an Italian film director, poet, communist, and homosexual, living and trying to love in mid-century Italy. 
the theme of Pasolini uh, is committing suicide on behalf of a principle, which has shamanic undertones. In Pasolini's instance, the theory was that he deliberately had himself murdered by the ragazzi, or young boys he visited outside Rome for sexual purposes. Pasolini meant to demonstrate with his own life that living in this made world was sordid and unlivable. I cite other artists with similar violent imaginations who would sacrifice life for a principle, including Van Gogh, Rambeau, of course, Artaud, and Simone Weil. No, not no. Sylvia Plath was attacked because she compared her emotional pain to the Holocaust with a capital H. Susan Sontag observed that though the Soviets were everywhere advertised as the arch enemy of capitalism, capitalism adored the Nazis because they were charismatic like sharks and serial killers. Elizabeth Costello could see as protagonist in the lives of animals insists that the meat slaughtering industry is equivalent to the Holocaust, with a capital H. When a writer asked Kafka how he was faring, Kay's response was, I consider it a blessing to simply stand in the corner and breathe. Crazy Horse, Sioux warrior and priest, was murdered young. He didn't permit himself to be photographed. His burial place has never been revealed. About William Blake, who distrusted the French, Bataille said, he was a man who never pursed his lips. Simone Weil, in 1940, as countries were knuckling under to fascism, said that she felt as if the center were shredding. We are in 2021. The center is shredded. 2021 has been a year of shredding, as you've put it. Can a center be found in our society? And to whom currently should we take cues from to find it? Those who live integrated lives, such as the Native Americans, have been genocided. They know where the center was. That center is long gone, replaced by greed, cruelty, distraction. Mark Rothko, while troubled, was able to create brilliant art. Can you touch on the phrase, I will kill myself today black, and its origins in the text? I will kill myself today black was a graffito I uncovered on the back of a cramped toilet in a luncheonette on 2nd Avenue and 24th Street as I was walking from Greenwich Village, where I lived, to the Guggenheim Museum to see a Rothko exhibit. Rothko had killed himself the year before, allegedly, with 66 palette knife slashes on his 66th birthday. He was despondent at not being duly appreciated. I was, in effect, relating the two suicidal artistic expressions. Rothko's, whose canvases sold for millions of dollars after his suicide, and the man, evidently black, who scrawled his desperate pleas on the back of a cramped toilet door. You might ask, in what sense is the graffito art? It is art because of its terrible beauty, which also represents the terrible beauty of many millions of desperate humans, humans made desperate by a merciless culture. Train. When John Coltrane visited Nagasaki in 1966, Nagasaki had not recovered emotionally from the U.S. atom bomb attack three days after the U.S. bombed Hiroshima in August 1945. When the car transporting John and Alice Coltrane pulled up to the greeting area in Nagasaki, Alice Coltrane got out, but Train stayed in the car playing notes on a flute. The Japanese host looked into the car and asked him what he was doing. John Coltrane whispered that he was trying to find the right music to commemorate Nagasaki. Later, a Japanese jazz fan asked Coltrane an odd question. What do you expect to be 10 years from now? Train answered at once, a saint. John Coltrane died the following year, 40 years old.
Japan has always been a country that sticks close to tradition and rarely lets the Western world dictate those ancient values. Do you think their acceptance of Coltrane and his music was a tender form of charity to the country's people after the horrors that they had been through in World War II? Yes, tender on each side, the Japanese and Coltrane. Do you believe that Nina Simone's pro-violence approach to the civil rights movement could have been effective? Nina Simone wasn't pro-violence per se, but didn't wish to exclude it in the ongoing fight for equal rights. Nina Simone endorsed Malcolm X by any means necessary. I agree with her, yes. Tuxedo. You are in Paris, Bastille Day. Change into a tuxedo, but first cut off the labels. Take a warm bath while wearing your tuxedo. Walk through the Bastille Cartier in your wet tuxedo without labels, shouting, La mort et mort, viva la rage. Love is dead. Can you speak on the shift in France and globally to this nihilistic view on compassion in the text? I would call it revolutionary rather than nihilistic. Passion of sex love is replaced by the passion of righteous rebellion. What can Black Lives Matter learn from the Black Panther? Well, ideally a good deal, but that isn't the way it's worked out. The Black Panthers and what they stood for has been lied about or erased or turned into pablum. Genet may still be read by intellectuals, but it is his, his sexual ideas rather than his revolutionary politics that tend to be foregrounded. Human shield, impelled by idealism, insert your body between war technology and its invested ethnocides. Die. In such a maddened world, what are some forms of protest that you believe are both easy and productive? Protests are variable, but never easy. In Human Shield, I'm referring to sacrifice, even of your life, which is, I believe, the most spiritual form of protest. You sprinkle the volume with various, sometimes extravagant, performance pieces like Tuxedo and Human Shield. Yes, I do. Glory hole. With your portable drill, drill a hole in any wall erected with hate and suspicion. Thrust your hand through the hole and shake the hand of anyone on the other side who is willing to shake hands. Don't display your face. Kuvad. Lie on the shelf above me. Experience my labor and have my baby. After I conceive, we will exchange places and I will experience your labor and have your baby. After we both conceive, we will make love deliriously. Is it your expectation that the reader will perform one or more of these performance pieces? Ideally, yes. Unusual texts even for you. How would you characterize them? Different looks at compassion. Why do you dedicate the book to Fanon? Franz Fanon was a psychiatrist from Martinique who wrote several essential revolutionary books, including Black Skin, White Masks, and The Wretched of the Earth. Fanon was a courageous human and author who had the courage to weep while making a formal presentation among African leaders in Nigeria in 1959. In the late 50s and early 60s, Africa was decolonizing, and Franz Fanon was in Nigeria representing Algeria. As happens on such occasions, the various heads of state made pro forma speeches, but when Fanon stood, someone in the crowd remarked that he had a severely serious look, and as he spoke passionately about the need for black Africa to respond collectively, he broke down and wept. Collective weeping is what the world needs to do a great deal more, and soon. 
Can you elaborate on the Cuban Revolution, which has been looked at in very different ways? The Cuban Revolution overthrew the corrupt Batista regime. Batista, friend and crony of the U.S. The compromises came later when the U.S. embargoed Cuba, which forced Fidel to align with the Soviet Union. Fidel and Che were less communist than democratic revolutionaries, and Nikita Khrushchev was always complaining about Fidel's laxity. Cuba under Fidel was far from perfect, but altogether it was a great experiment that did much more good than not, not only for Cubans, but for the poor in Africa, Central and South America, and elsewhere, to whom Fidel's Cuba generously sent aid of various sorts. Man Ray, the genesis of Man Ray's inspirational flat iron with brass tacks glued in a column down the center, includes these two options. Man Ray had another sculpture prepared for an impending exhibition in a Paris gallery, which was stolen. So without forethought, uh, he bought what he needed in a hardware store and assembled Le Cadeau, the gift, in 45 minutes in the store itself. Man Ray had just met and befriended the charming Eric Satie and decided on the moment to present Satie with a gift, seemingly with Without forethought, Man Ray went into the nearest hardware store in Montmartre and purchased a flat iron, brass tacks, and a tube of glue, which he assembled in half an hour on the spot. Sati received Le Cadeau with grace and an admiring chuckle. The cover of the collection points to this text being its main influence. Can you go into detail about what Man Ray and his art mean to you? Man Ray, Emmanuel Rednitsky, a first-generation Russian Jew born in Philadelphia, left for Paris when he was 30, not knowing a single word of French, and made an immediate impression. He was a wonderfully resourceful painter, and if anything, an even more imaginative photographer. He became lifelong friends with another extraordinary artist who was his physical opposite, Marcel Duchamp from Brittany. Man Ray was a dominion first-generation Jew who was brilliant and fearless. Do whites imitate blacks because they, in fact, fear the sanctity of the culture they created? Whites, especially young white people, imitate blacks because they recognize, often without realizing it, that black people are more artistic and poetic than they. Why, in your opinion, has the term Lolita and the book by Nabokov been the subject of scrutiny by the prudish all these years? Because a middle-aged white intellectual male seduces a 12-year-old white girl with savor and no apology. Steak, first frame, middle-aged white male, naked from the waist up, lies on his back. He is overweight, has a smartphone attached to his belt, and wears strong cologne. In the middle of his naked, hairless chest is a porterhouse steak. He falls asleep and snores loudly. Second frame, slender teens in hip-hop outfits enter his space stealthily. They remove the porterhouse steak from his chest and substitute a large graphic of a stock animal being brutally slaughtered. Third frame, the teens are tossing porterhouse steaks from an overhead ramp onto the busy freeway. Some experts claim that society moving away from eating meat may impact climate change and its eventual destruction of our environment. Would you prescribe veganism as a non-violent and helpful form of protest? I'd rather that stock animals and poultry not suffer and then be slaughtered. 
Ted and Sylvia, what happened? Two brilliant, obsessed poets who were absolutely not meant for each other. Married, wrote wonderful poetry, and died miserably. The wonderful poetry was transfigured from their misery, especially in the instance of Sylvia Plath. Had they not married, they would certainly have been less miserable and just as certainly less imposing poets. Why do you align Greta Thunberg and William Blake in this piece? Greta understood Blake's Songs of Innocence without having read it. She is our gift, and so is William Blake. Each is wrongly considered disturbed. Greta with Asperger's, Blake with schizophrenia. That is, Greta's Asperger's and Blake's alleged schizophrenia contributed to their specialness. Black Elk. Black Elk, the Oglala Sioux shaman, was cousin to the warrior dreamer Crazy Horse. Black Elk recognized his shamanic calling early, but was reluctant to leave the fallen world behind to become a Hayoka, the sacred clown whose prime work was to inhabit the fallen world not as an occupant, but an empath, or in Mahayana Buddhism, a Bodhisattva. Sattva. Moreover, he was not certain that he was capable. Though reluctant, Black Elk accepted his calling and accomplished great good. Can you comment on your abiding interest in Native America? Your second published book, Morning Crazy Horse, seems like a good starting point. They are humans who, by and large, lived respectful, integrated lives, as a result of which they were genocided. Why did you insert yourself onto the set with Marlon Brando? Because it felt like the thing to do. I feel, and have always felt, very close to Brando. I thought that the imaginary Jaffe would be able to interview the imaginary Brando imaginatively. There's also a vulnerability there on the part of Brando and on the part of Jaffe, the angry writer. We understand Brando's because of what the reader learns earlier in the collection. Yours is elusive, not sleeve worn. I'm sure you would agree with that. Discuss your kinship with Van Gogh. You mention him often in your work. There are many artists I like, but there are certain artists I love. I've cited Alberto Giacometti, Vincent is another. He is among the most feeling humans who ever lived while being a great artist. And this is crucial, of course. His art is filled with merciful acknowledgement of the poor and dispossessed. Are Artaud's words meant to invoke a dialogue between yourself and the concept of art brute? How does one converse with an idea? The term art brute was coined by the French painter Jean Dubuffet in 1949 to refer to mentally institutionalized humans who somehow found the time and space to create powerful art, especially drawing and painting. In the text Brute, I mean to indicate the brilliance of art brute and relate what might be called violent imaginings to psychosis. The two, violent imaginings and psychosis, are confluent until a certain point, and then they diverge. Sometimes they don't quite diverge. But in that instance, the violent imaginer almost always has the resources to maintain his or her emotional balance. In the text Brute, I was writing as close to unconsciously as I've ever written. Finally, what are you hoping to accomplish with this collection? If you had asked me the same question 25 or 30 years ago, I'd say that I hoped that readers would learn to extend their sympathies and recognize that it is not the mind, but what I call the heart mind, that makes a difference. But we are in 2021 now, and many fewer people read books or ruminate about them. So let me ask you what you think Brute might accomplish. It strikes me 
me as a call to arms for the next generation of writers to remember that inspiration can come from anywhere. As you've already mentioned, a transfiguration of pain into beauty, to shed light on the intentions of these figures, to live without apology, accepting the torment and turning that distress into elegance, into grace. Their lives, their stories, their creations shape not just these texts, but any text that they inspire. Your condensing of their wounds doesn't take away from that allure, only helps make it all more relatable. You don't hold the reader's hand. If the artists had to feel pain for their art, then so too must those who wish to understand them at any depth. If your collection does anything, it does that.